Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 Electronic Annual Report and SB 1383 Open Q&A session. My name is Chris Bria. You may remember me from you know, the last decade of webinars on the year. Also with us today is Andrew Parrish, who's been working on the ear very diligently for the last couple of years and knows all the new technical stuff. We will also have Kara Morgan, the, land, the local assistance and market development branch chief, as well as Ashley Yi, the jurisdiction assistance and uh, what is it? Jurisdiction assistance compliance enforcement branch. Sorry, it's still new. Uh, anyway, they will be joining us shortly. Uh, in the meantime, on the screen, you'll see a disclaimer stating that what we're talking about here is really, you know, it's all informational, it's example purposes, anything you see that we're working on in the logic database, we will be working on it uh, in a staging environment that will be indicated by a yellow bar across the top of the screen. And yeah, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can in the time we have allotted. If you have questions, please put them into the questions pane of the GoToMeeting. And Ray Caranza, who is also with us, will be reading those off as they come in. And we're going to do our best to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. And we do have a few that were emailed ahead of time. And rather than jump right into those, in case the persons, the people who sent them are not quite on yet. We will wait for the first question to show up in the question pane. And also now on the screen, you'll see some of the instructions I just mentioned. So yes, if you have questions, please put them in the pane. We will unmute you if you'd like, and you can ask it out loud and we can continue a discussion. Uh, other than that, let's get ready to go. And oh wait, look, now there's a bunch of questions, cool. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, our first question is from Tim Kruger. Tim, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you'd like to ask your question um, or provide some clarifying information. Um, please remember to state your affiliation and your name. If not, I will go ahead and begin reading. Uh, regarding the section 18984.1A1, a three container organic waste collection service, green container, can that be on? I'm sorry, can that be on-call service or does it need to have regular or scheduled service? Same question for the section 18984.1A2 blue container. I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, so as regarding the three container and two container, and I, I mean, for that matter, the one container system. So as part of the 1383 regulations, um, collection of all materials is required. So I guess just to ask you some questions, Tim, um, I mean, if there's some scenarios where if they're self-hauling, they don't necessarily need a blue or con green container, but service does is required to be provided for a collection of all those materials depending on the system that you are implementing. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. It was just basically if a generator opts to have, say, a green container as an on-call um, and then maybe never calls to pick it up or um, it gets picked up once every six months or something, does that still count towards three container service or would they need a regularly picked up green container? I see. Um... I, I mean, I guess it would kind of come down to the protrusible factor as well. So as long as but that would be more a conversation with your local enforcement agency to make sure that you're not kind of violating any of those uh, vector issues that may be caused by not servicing a container. But as long as the materials are being diverted, I think there could be some flexibility there, but it does need to be provided. I don't know if that helps clarify it further. It does. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next question is from Rosine Salmo. 
Rosine asks, do we fill out the disposal rate calculation and the calculation factor? And Rosine, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you if you would like to provide any additional information. Yeah, hi. So when I'm trying to fill out the EAR, these two sections are already filled out for us. So I'm not sure what is um, the resource and how were they uh, filled out? Because it won't let me change them. Um, well, there is some info in the um, in the calculator that preloads, like the disposal data for things. Uh, what jurisdiction are you looking at? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm with the city of Modesto. Modesto, all right. Give me one second to take a look. Um, because we don't do medical waste, um, CND is separate than us. Mm -hmm. Oh, those, yeah, those are disposal credit, disposal credits. So there's certain things that are approved uh, credits that can be taken away or can be um, removed from your disposal total. Uh, so I'm so I'm navigating over to your ear as we speak. But yeah, th there shouldn't be anything in those unless someone else had already gone in and put those in before you saw it so let me get there da, da, da. Disposal rate calculation so i am looking at your yeah so i'm looking at your screen and let me i will shit move this over and share it since i still am presenter so what you're seeing on this screen is these numbers up top these are these are imported in from the RDRS, the Recycling and Disposal Reporting System. Okay. And so that number's already there. And so what you would be able to change is if you pressed edit, and let's say you had qualifying medical waste or qualifying CND waste or out diverted out of state export waste, you could put that number in here and you would fill out the disposal or the reporting your disposal modification certifi certification sheet. Uh, there's a link to it up here in this definition of term section that also has more expansive definitions for what qualifies for each of these types of disposal reduction credit. So uh, you should, I mean, I was able to press edit and come in and Okay. Things, yeah, so. so we don't have any of those, so we can just leave it as is, right? We. Oh yeah, if you're not, if you're not going to claim any of those credits, you would not need to, to do anything in this section, no. Okay, and it's similar to the calculation factors? Uh, calculation factors is a little bit different. Calculation factors, if you were um, going to claim one of those credits, it would show up here in this calculation factor section where these boxes may be checked. And something else you may need to do here, if you had green waste ADC tons, you may need to answer additional questions. Uh, the first question box here, if you had any tons at all, and questions two and three if you are not meeting your per capita rate target. So since you have no green waste, uh, what all you would need to do on this page, and notice it's already checked green, I did go to live just to see if anything had been entered in those. Uh, since you've already answered no, you would be done with this section as it is. Oh, there, okay. there you are, you were the last one edit. Okay. Yes, okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. And as a quick reminder, uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be available online once it is made ADA accessible. Um, next question is from Allison Abers. Um, they are asking about Alameda County's ear and how it should be structured or it makes more sense to be structured as a regional agency ear. Can you please demonstrate what a regional agency ear looks like, including pointing out which pieces of the report are specific to SB 1383, and you are unmuted, Allison. Chris, you want to pass me presenter, or do you want to drive?
So I was talking and I was muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. So the difference between a single jurisdiction and a regional agency and or a designated reporting uh, jurisdiction, like in this case, Garden Grove is re actually reporting for two, uh, two jurisdictions, both for Garden Grove and the Garden Grove Sanitary District. Um, what you'll see in a lot of these sections, such as procurement or uh, in this case, uh, collection si systems, when you come in for each entity you are reporting for, so in this case for Alameda, let's say right now all you see right here would be Alameda Unincorporated, but if we were to add, I'm guessing like Castro Valley Sanitary District, what you would end up seeing on each of the places where you need to have more than one reporting entity showing, you might have Alameda Unincorporated here and then the district in the county, Castro Valley, right here. And then for however many other jurisdictions you're reporting for, you would see those as line item entries throughout the year in any place where that type of reporting makes sense. Same thing here with procurement. You would see you know, more than one jurisdiction listed. Allison, does that answer your question? Allison, we can't hear you if you are speaking. You are unmuted. Okay. Okay. I'll take silence for confirmation. Uh, our next question is from Colleen Weeks. Colleen points out that um, they noticed a subreport error when printing the EAR, and it is always in the commercial section. Are you working on this issue? I think maybe Colleen will need to elaborate a little bit more on what issue it is. So Colleen, you are now unmuted on our end. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yep. Great, okay, I work with Vertec in several cities, so I'll just list it as Vertec in several cities. And um, when we go to, re we, you know, we put the generator and all the different things in the different sections, but for example, when I print out for Barstow, every single time when you go to do a print, it shows you nothing for that section. It will do residential, but it doesn't do for the um, commercial. And I've done it for more than one city now. So every time you go to print it, that does not show up that you just clicked on the screen. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you go to Barstow, list Barstow, go up, go up, there you go. You will see their stuff entered in for Barstow. And you're, you're saying like in the commercial program section, this right. one. See, see the whole nine yards. But when you go to print it, none of that shows up there. The SHRI shows up at the back end, but you don't get the category, the material type collected. You don't get any of that. You just get a message each time and it says sub report error. And it's not just on Barstow. It's every single one of the cities we are working with. When we go and when to you're saying printing, you mean the report summary? Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's correct. Um, well, I don't, are, are, Andrew, are we working on this one? Is this part of one of those other errors that someone mentioned in the last week? I'm not familiar with this happening yet. So this might be the first I'm hearing about it, I think. Yeah, so this is I'm also looking, the first time I've heard of it. And you know yeah. how you can actually do it where you said you can go back into it where it's off the list, you just put the year 2021. So I see how you say the report summary there. I didn't do it from there, but you know how like if you're on the logic a step back and you're on Barstow and you do the um when it asks you to before this screen, you know how when you're on the screen before this before you okay. go into the detail and you put for pretty, you know, how another way to get a PDF on the report. Nothing and I put 2021 and every time it does it as a sub error, always. Oh, so I, wait a minute. So, you go talking to, about... so go to your right, correct. Here. Right. Yes. Uh, huh. Uh, no, I think this is the first we're hearing about that. I wasn't aware there was a 
different because I was looking at, at the PDF I just voted and I was like, I don't know. It seems like there's stuff. There's some yeah. stuff on. Oh, wait, wait. I oh, know. I see. You're ah, right here. Okay. Right there. That's the thing I get on it every single time. But the Shree does show up in the back end. It just okay. doesn't show up in that part. And the different well, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at this. I think this is the first time we're hearing about this this particular thing. So thank you. That's good to know. Okay. All right. Our next couple questions come from Sadie Caldas. So Sadie, um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you right now so that you can ask both of them. Sadie, you're unmuted on our end. Hi there. Um, thank you. I just wanted to check in on the collection system tab. Um, in a previous webinar, I thought we were suppo supposed to include the count of generators with the waiver um, in the different, like, three container, two container programs, but it doesn't look like it in the ears. So I just wanted to see if I misunderstood or if we are supposed to include generators with waivers in that tab. Uh, which jurisdiction? This is for Placer County. Okay, and you are saying on the which tab, the waivers and exemptions tab? No, under the collection systems oh. tab. And you were saying you wanted to include the waiver number. Ah, like right, 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 right here. Not, you mean? No, um, up a little bit holler, where or holler, up a little higher, where there's um, it has the different type of program, like the three. Yes, right here. Okay. Were we supposed to include the number of generators with a waiver when we put the numbers? Here. Andrew, do you want to take this one? You're more familiar with this screen than I am. Um, I do believe it is the generators that have service is what we're looking for here because the waiver section is a little different. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, your question is really, do I put the waived generators in this number of generators uh, box is the question? Yes. In addition to where you already specify the number of waivers? Yes. Yeah. Um, and they provided no service at all, or do they have a waiver from just one particular container? Uh, we have generators with waivers that also have service. Okay, so I would include them in your numbers for um, the service you're providing. Okay. Because they still are in that um, container system. Sorry, I'm not using my words very well. They're still included in generators that are being provided service. And okay. then in waivers column, or uh, the waivers and exemptions section, you would report where they have the waivers from. So there's nowhere in here to kind of specify it unless you wanted to include additional uh, anything in the additional details box as far as it, um, the number of generators that may be waived and what they're waived from. Okay, that sounds good. And I have a couple other questions. Um, on this same tab, if you scroll down to where you list the hauler names, um the organic waste haulers so i just wanted to to make sure that if we have the same programs we could just list it under one hauler name um i think what i have in here is like exclusive franchise hauler i mean can we put something like that and just do our totals we only have to break it out by hauler if we have different programs is that right Uh, yes, that is fine. We designed it so that if you did have different collection systems between the haulers, that you'd be able to provide that level of detail. But if they're all the same system, then you can just do what you've done here. Okay. And then I have one last question. Um, on the enforceable mechanisms and ordinances tab, 
It asks about changes to um, our ordinance or contact information. If we adopted an ordinance or made any changes to our ordinances before the April report, the initial jurisdiction report, can we just mark no for the changes? I mean, if, is it is this since the April report or is this like 2021 and 2022 time period? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, Andrew, I'll take that one. So the, the ordinances, everything else, um, while that was stuff was due in April, we know a number of jurisdictions ended up resubmitting their ordinance, maybe in some cases more than once because they had to make some kind of change to add an enforceable mechanism to it or uh, add some other kind of language to make it compliant so they could receive uh, grant money earlier this year. If you had sent that ordinance in uh, between, you know, after April, pretty much some were still rolling in a week ago. Uh, if you'd sent that ordinance in, we have a copy of it and I think we're generally okay with it because pretty much any ordinance changes that have been happening the last few months, we should be aware. So if you if you emailed it into the SLCP mailbox anytime since April, we have a copy of it. So I think you could probably say that there's no changes. You know, next year if you make another change and we don't have a copy, that's where you would want to say yes, we changed it, and then upload a new version. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really good question because a lot of folks have been changing ordinances over the last few months. Thank you, Sadie. Did that answer all of your questions? It did, yeah, thank you. All right, perfect. Next up, we have Susan Strand. Susan asks, regarding edible food recovery, total pounds of edible food recovered by food recovery organizations and services, is this in regard to new excess edible food recovered or pounds of all edible food recovered by all food recovery organizations within the jurisdiction? Susan, you are unmuted on our end. I think it makes sense. So it seems like the question is, what do you report? And Chris, can can you pass me a presenter, please? Just so I can highlight those areas so that everyone can see what we're talking about. Yes. All right, you're a presenter now. Yeah. No. Don't feel like I'm showing my screen. Hold on. Yeah, we see it on the screen. Yeah, there it is. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we'll just jump into, I'm gonna use you, Adelanto, because it's all kind of the same sections here. So in edible food, I'm assuming you're asking about this question here the total pounds of edible food recovered right. by food rec yeah okay good um okay so let me reread your question just to make sure i'm capturing it correctly so in this field you're going to report the total pounds of edible food recovered by all food recovery services and organizations located within your jurisdiction is that answering your question or am i yeah. missing of it yeah i was wondering if it was just the new excess edible food that was recovered or just total pounds recovered within the jurisdiction. So so it's everything. It's not just the new excess edible food. Right, the total pounds that were recovered. So I don't know, the, ex, the word excess is kind of confusing me where you're going. Do you want to explain that part a little bit more? Yeah, so... Um, SB 1383 requires jurisdictions to um, collect the excess edible, make sure that there's uh, resources to collect excess edible food, mm -hmm. which we are working on. Um, so I was wondering if you're just interested in knowing our success or um, what's going on already without our help. Got you. So I think 
this would just be the data that has been reported to you from the food recovery uh, organizations and services of the total pounds of edible food that's been recovered for this particular report, the period of January 1st to June 30th, 2022. Okay, is that, great. Is that, that answering your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Next question is Caitlin Lillis. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Can Cal Recycle staff pull up the parts of the ear we are discussing, seeing it would be really helpful? I think that's what we've been trying to do, but um, we'll go ahead and take note of that. Next up, we have Margaret Kashuba. In the collection systems tab, when adding a hauler for the collection container systems, the system is required requiring data to be entered for both the residential and commercial sectors, but our commercial haulers only service commercial generators and the city only services residential generators. Right, we got this question asked one time before and in the upcoming year, we'll add a little bit more functionality that you can specify between commercial and I suppose it doesn't really matter which one I go to. We'll go to more park here. Um, but I'll, sh I'll show you what we said previously. So in this collection container system grid, um, it, you can, if you wanna describe them in a certain way and say commercial hauler one or whatever it may be, you can add that here specify that um, collection, or sorry, here, we're going commercial. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. So enter the number of generators that are receiving that commercial service. And then since the residential part is still requiring you to make an entry, select other, you can put zero here. And then just in the additional um, notes column, say only commercial hauler or something along those lines. If you wanna provide a more detailed explanation, you can, but that's gonna be the solution for this particular reporting cycle since it is requiring you to make an entry, but we've made note of that and we will have a fix for that on the next reporting cycle. Does that answer your question? Margaret, you're unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, it does. Thanks, Andrew. Uh-huh. Um, I had a couple questions, more questions on this page too. Sure. Um, like under organic waste haulers at the bottom, do you want us to report just like on our um, like large commercial haulers uh, that provide all three services? Or do you want us to also include like small haulers that only do C and D or you know, one time like roll off dumpsters and not regular service um, for that section. I do have an answer for you and I wanna bring up my notes to make sure I answer it correctly here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So All I was right. thinking C and D includes lumber and that, that's organic waste so it would fall under that but we weren't sure. Yeah, so on the approved haulers section, so I guess for those watching, we're talking about this last grid here, organic waste haulers, and I can open it up so you can see specifically. Um, so it's to authorize all haulers that are hauling solid waste. So that could be franchise haulers, could be permitted haulers, could be haulers such as 1-800-GOT-JUNK are hauling mm -hmm. wood material only. And then I'm missing my notes, Kara, I know there was something specific about C and D. Oh, exclusions are, um, I'm sorry, Carrie, do you, would you mind jumping sure. in there for me? Yeah, so um, jurisdictions are not required um, to uh, for C and D haulers or community composters. Um, they're not subject to the requirements in Article 7. Um, C and D um, haulers, right, are going to be subject to the CalGreen building requirements. And so that's how you're addressing ensuring that C&D haulers are uh, properly recycling. Did that help answer the question? Yeah, yeah, it did. Did you have any more questions, Margaret? 
Um, so then we, um, I guess uh, if you scroll back up to the collection container systems, then we wouldn't include the C and D and and small like junk hauling haulers up here either for the the generator numbers and collection systems. Not if they're not providing one of these collection container systems specified. If they're just kind of one-time haulers of materials like 1-800-GOT-JUNK, you wouldn't include them up here. Okay. All right, thank you. I did have one last question, oh. <laughs> if that's okay, but it's not related to this page. Yeah, that's fine. That's why we're here. Okay. Um, it's under the Education and Outreach tab. So it says um, what type of education outreach is provided to all generators, including SLCP, Moore, MCR, SHRI. Um, and then it further breaks it down to the number of generators that received SLCP material. So for when I'm quantifying the number of generators, um, it has SLCP and then it also covers all of them. So I'm not sure if you only want numbers for, for SB 1383 education or everything, or if I should just break it down further in the, the description box. Yeah, so we're doing a, we're, trying to do a few things here and tried to simplify the education outreach section. So the reason we have everything included, and I suppose I'll just highlight the name of the grid here, is that so you can uh, report on all education outreach you're doing. And since the focus has kind of shifted through the years from what you need to do for a particular law and more on a material focus, we kind of recognize that there's a lot of overlap between these programs. So this grid, what it's trying to accomplish is you're just kind of reporting on the education outreach um, that you're doing to divert materials. It doesn't need necessarily be specific for each law. Okay. Uh, so, and then as far as the number of generators requirement, that's only a uh, 1383 or SLCP reporting requirement. So we recognize that it okay. may include everyone but as far as the reporting requirements are concerned, you're only required to uh, report the number of SLCP generators that receive that material. Okay. All right, that makes sense. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, next up we have Sean Graham. Sean has a question regarding the disaster waste section for Plumas County. Sean, you are unmuted on our end. Hi, yeah, my name is Sean Graham. I'm up from Plumas County. Uh, well, when I first put that in the box, it was just, I only had a question regarding that, but I'm, you know, realistically, I feel like I could take up this, this whole webinar asking questions. Um, so for the disaster waste section, I guess that is in uh, disposal rate calculation. I guess I was somewhat confused as to like what that means because you know, uh, as many of you might know, the Dixie Fire did largely occur in Plumas County, and so um, lots of waste was hauled out, but that was hauled out sort of by the state. So I don't know the numbers uh, on that, like how much how much waste was pulled out of the county. Um, is that something that I need to? basically try to find out and then report in this section here. Uh, I was guess I was just confused by that category. Um, this is Chris, I can take this one. So as Andrew is so conveniently hovering over the, the tooltip on this one, disaster waste was a previous category that was something you could deduct from the total if you had it um, uh -huh. due to changes in the RDRS system both disaster and class two waste are no longer or are, are no longer supposed to be reported um, in RDRS by jurisdiction of origin. And it's so it's not going to necessarily be in your disposal total. So as you can see on this screen, I don't think this is necessarily plumis, but that 21,000 ton, that total report year disposal amount, that should not include any class two or disaster waste. 
just from yeah, the... it looks like you actually are on my screen where we okay um yeah, so, you are on so, the Plymouth county screen yeah um, i mean there shouldn't be any disaster waste in that total if you think there is yeah you would want to contact rdrs okay to get that changed but generally i i haven't heard of any you know this was something we thought might happen but i haven't actually heard of anything where it's like Oh wait, no! All this disaster waste got reported. To gotcha. Messed this up. So okay. I, th so I think facilities have been good about keeping disaster away from a jurisdiction of origin. Okay, uh, that, that's kind of what I assumed. Since you know, like I said, yeah, that the state handled handled that cleanup. Okay. Um, I'll I'll try to hit these sort of rapidly because um, I know other folks have questions. Um on the collection systems so plumas county uh does have the rural exemption but as i understand it that that exemption really only is uh an exemption for like commercial organic pickup so uh, i i'm somewhat confused by this interface because it has hauler name right so plumas county has two different franchise areas um but none of the residential because of the the rural exemption none of our uh, residential like generators it, it applies so would i then basically you know indicate rural exemption and then go to for residential systems go other and the number of generators basically i mean i i could ask the haulers for numbers like the number of accounts basically is that sort of what this um tab is looking for um yes that's what it's looking for but when you have a rural exemption you select this box mm -hmm. even though it appears that there's required fields you can just hit save and it bypasses the whole thing so there are no reporting oh, okay. requirements for you there residential okay, or commercial oh okay so then i think that would apply to the the compostable plastic bags as well um yep any anywhere like where lot. this checkbox shows up you just click that and, and then save. save and it bypasses gotcha. it all well okay because that there, there's other areas where the the um for example under procurement uh it says recovered organic waste product procured there's a rural exemption tab i wasn't aware that that exempted us from anything involving procurement. I mean, I guess I could just be wrong in that regard. So is what you're saying is that in any of these tabs where there's the rural exemption box, just tick it and save and that's that? Yeah, I'll go a little bit more in detail on procurement because we did combine a few things here. But yes, in this okay. box, you click rural exemption because there's no 1383 recovered organic waste product procurement requirements if you have the rural exemption, not yet at least up okay. through 2026. Yes. However, except for um, you do still have to procure the 30% recycled content paper. It does not Got, exclude yeah. you from okay. that, but there's just no reporting requirement on paper procurement. Okay. And then down here in this recycle product procurement area, this has elements of AB 939 as well as 1383. Gotcha. So you'd want to select the ones that apply for 939. Okay. So like uh, one probably as an example. Right. Yeah. Well, it's weird. The, the question box um, only appear for for some um yeah these were just intended to be tool tips if it seemed unclear we, whereas gotcha. like we felt that the recycled content paper and with the uh, explanation in parentheses kind of provided that extra tool tip already and we just didn't think it needed uh, but we'd, sure. we'd love to know if you think it does we can always add additional tool tips gotcha and because here it's it's not really showing any quantity so is is this if we were able to procure sort of any percentage um, within these categories, then we just tick that off? Correct, yeah, there's no requirement okay. to report quantities in this uh, checkbox section. Understood, yes. okay. And Sean, this is Kara, I just wanna add also that there's no requirements at all to report on quantities of recycled content paper. Okay. Paper Okie doke. Um, let me just go down the list. For okay, under the 
uh, education and outreach. I think the prior person kind of clarified this for me, but I just wanted to be sure. Um, I pr produced um, basically uh, SB 1383 outreach material and distributed it uh, to all of our tier one and tier two generators, either electronically, a few we had to do via direct contact. Um, but the fact that there's sort of two different boxes here um, is uh, what confuses me, the SLCP one, and then it says commercial edible food generators is like the the second sub box. Will, I f will the answer basically be the same for, for both? Maybe um, I'll back it up here. So to start, there's two grids, right? One for kind yes. of your overall SLCP, MCR, Moore, SHRI, and HHWE education outreach. And then the second one, um, which we'll put in the blue box here for commercial edible food generators education outreach. Uh -huh. So you'll yeah. kind of see already on your report you have this rural exemption here. Okay. Up in the oh, uh, so so what I area. produced. I see what you're saying. So the 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 material that I produced and distributed, that that's what I'm reporting on in the 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 second category. Mm -hmm. For your particular case, you're not reporting up here on that. You're reporting on more MCR, SHRI, HHWE in this upper grid. And then as far as the numbers are concerned, if I heard you correctly, you'd report your numbers of the commercial edible food generators that receive the SLCP education not reach in the second grid. So there'd be no numbers gotcha. you need to report in the first grid because you have the rural exemption. Gotcha. Whereas okay. down here, there's no option for that rural exemption, so you're required to report down here. Um, okay. Um, and then I guess my my last question before I hand it over. My apologies. I've I've I'm cognizant of the time I've used. Um, under the facility section, is this as straightforward um, as when it says briefly describe the programs as like you know landfill, transfer station, compost facility, biomass, etc. Do I literally just describe, you know, the, the county has uh, one landfill that's active, one that's closed, and then uh, some six odd transfer stations? Basically just list them and discuss them. So this section's 100% AB 939, and these program codes are related to that law in particular. So these are elements that you have selected in your uh, source reduction recycling element a long time ago. And the main purpose of this section and that checkbox is to make sure that this area is up to date and current. As far as the briefly describe that you're talking about is if you want to provide any additional information. So there's no really requirement. Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm talking about the facilities section or are we looking? Oh, yeah, I'm seeing on the screen it looks. Here, we'll, we'll go back the other way so you can show it the other way. I just want to show you the program details. Okay, so this is the facility section. Yes. If you edit here and you select this, I clicked on the hyperlink. That's what you just saw. Yeah. So here, all you need to do is go through, check the box, and by checking the box, you're saying that the program details that I just showed you, I won't go to it again since it's a little slow, are sure. up to date and current. If you would like okay. to provide more information about your uh, the specifics of what you're doing at your landfill for diversion programs, you can provide that explanation here, but there's no requirement okay. to put any text here. Okay, uh, yeah, understood. Um, I, I think that's it for from me. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. All right, thank you all. Uh, the next question is from Robin Nelson asking, how can we get the population changed for our city? Um, you, you can't really, I mean, you can take that up with the Census Bureau, I guess, or the Department of Finance where we get the population number from. Uh, your population, was 26,296 in 2018, 26,489 in 2019, 26,006 in 2020, and 25,383 in 2021. Um, there's sort of a 
you know, a slight downward trend there the last three years, but also the last couple of years, you know, the census is done every decade. And so the numbers at the end of the decade are extrapolations of the census done, you know, 10 years before. So the number that you have this year for your population is about as correct as it's going to be. Um, we don't really have any control over that number or not. And if you'd like to follow up and if you have some more information you'd like to add to that as to why it should be changed, um, that's fine. I just don't think that's something within our purview. Uh, Robin, you are unmuted if you'd like to add anything to that. Um, okay, uh, I just, when I looked at information on, on the city website and then also online, I came up with a higher population number and we have been struggling lately to figure out why we're over target. And so I didn't know if that might have anything to do with why we're over our um, pounds per day target. Um, so that's why I was asking. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Corey Jones um, asking us to please cover how to report an adjusted procurement target. Sure. So the adjusted procurement target, um, I'll just go to it. So in here. Andrew, really quick, um, one thing, uh, getting back to the question about Galt and their um, being over target. Looking at your disposal numbers before RDRS and what you currently have, I think you might want to check with any facilities that are reporting disposal in your name because it's it like doubled and tripled since RDRS started. So that would probably be your first spot to look, not population. Thanks, Chris. So for the adjusted recovered organic waste product procured grid, if you want a new target, you say yes to this question when it activates it. And then you're gonna enter your total transportation fuel, total electricity, total gas used for heating applications uh, for the previous calendar year. And this doesn't have to be organically derived. It is all um, all usage for, for these different categories. Does that answer your question? And I think Kara added um, regulation sections as well. Yeah, Andrew, I just wanted to add that um, I wouldn't uh, expect a jurisdiction to report on this in this annual report. They would actually report on it um, uh, when the report is due on August 1st, 2023, which will cover the entire year of 2022. Thanks, Kara. Corey, you are unmuted on our end. If you'd like to add any more or confirm that that answered your question. Uh, that did. Thank you. Ray, can we take one more question from the question list? And then we have some in the SLCP inbox, some that were mailed ahead of time that we should get to as well. Yeah. And Ray, I think, um, Andrew, we need to, uh, we've had two questions on what gets reported for what year, 2021 and 2022. Can we go over that, please? Yes. Uh, so for AB 939, which is your uh, SHRI and HHWE report on 2021 status, for SB 1383, you're going to report on the period between January 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2022. And I think there was a little confusion on MCR and more. So I, let me bring up my note on that. Okay. So previously we were stating for MCR and more report on the most current data through June of 2022. And um, that is one option you can do, but as far as the reporting requirements concerned for MCR and more, you only have to report on 2021 numbers. And the, um, the reason we made that statement before 
and we're requesting those numbers up through June 2022 is that it helps show uh, progress. Um, and so if you're deciding to report the same numbers for MCR more and 1383, then we would expect those numbers to be up through June of 2022. So as a visual aid, let me go to that section. Where is it? So we have the three separate grids. There's the SLCP, go back to red, I guess more and MCR. So if you only have numbers for more and MCR for 2021, you report those numbers. And then for SLCP, you can report just on the period from January 1st of 2022 to June 30th, 2022. I don't know if that helps clarify the the what's we're asking to be reported. Kara, Ashley, do you want to add anything else? No, you covered it. Okay. Did we still want to do one more from the question pane, or go right to SLCP inbox? Let's do one from the inbox because I think it's a good scenario question. Uh, that might be helpful for everyone to hear. Um, Andrew, are you talking about the one from Kim or from previous? Uh, it's from the Recyclist. I'll read it out here. Okay. We'll, we'll do them and then we'll do the one from SWS. So we're, what we're referring to is the collection systems grid. And to get a little specific on things, we're going to use Plumasana Incorporated as the example here. So the scenario is a total of 100 commercial generators are provided garbage service through hauler A and recycling in organic services through hauler B. The questions about this scenario, should the jurisdiction enter 100 in just one row for hauler A or also enter 100 in a second row for hauler B? Or should the jurisdiction use the three containers box or the other box for hauler A and or hauler B? So I know that's probably hard to see. Um, sorry, hold on, bear with me just one moment here. Okay, there, it's getting a little feedback there. Okay, so I'm gonna rephrase this example just slightly, so we'll say, Hauler A has a is providing a three container service. And we'll just say it's consistent for both residential and commercial. So if they're providing that three container service to 900 of that 1000, you would enter the 900 here. And then for the 100 that are only receiving um, just trash service, we'll say just resident or well, commercial, I guess, makes a little more sense. Select other, enter that 100 here. And then in the additional details box, just provide an explanation of why you checked the other and what's going on there. So 100 commercial generators receiving I can't spell and talk at the same time, um, trash service only. And then when you get to the hauler B, you do the opposite of this. So you would go and we'll say hauler B also has a thousand total generators providing three container collection systems. So you'd enter the 900 into the 100 over here, but then say 100 commercial generators receiving uh, blue and green container service if that helps, if and this is from Lisa Colo. Hopefully I didn't butcher your name. I don't know if you're on, but if there's anything else you wanted us to clarify. Um, thank you so much, that helps a lot. Um, and that actually kind of leads to a follow-up question. We have um, some scenarios where a hauler is only providing the blue and green service and we don't quite know what's happening with the garbage service if 
it um, is a shared service, like a property manager is providing shared garbage service, but for the local franchise, you know, the hauler has to provide blue and green service. Would we indicate something like this similarly, or do you have any recommendations? Yeah, I would enter it similarly and just go with the numbers you know where the, the number of generators that are being provided service and then just providing that additional detail of there's you know 50 unknown accounts we're still actively working to sort out how they receive you know they do have all three containers but we're not sure who's providing the trash service but they do have all three containers does that help clarify it it does thank you okay. chris do you have another one in the SOCP inbox actually got a bunch <laughs> well, well we've got two minutes left let's do what we can okay one from ted ward from del norte county solid waste management authority he's got a question saying that he's got inputs that exceed the character limits i thought we set that at like ten thousand characters or something extremely long in, in a lot of cases um as far as what you would do to elaborate more than you are already able to. Your suggestion is you do a cross-reference document that you upload in the document section. Sure, that's probably it. Um, I, when we set up a lot of these new fields, we did test the character limits on a lot. And it's like, well, I think what we ended up doing was it's like in the in the tree program section. I think we tested as like a, and more than an entire page of a Word document could fit into each box. So depending on how elaborate you're getting, that's already quite a bit of text. Um, so that would be the best way to handle uh, answers that exceed the character limits of any boxes. Uh, another question from Ted is he would like us to describe the sources of the numbers in the disposal rate calculator and describe circumstances and procedures for adjusting these disposal numbers if they don't match the facility tonnages. We've gone over the calculator in previous webinars uh, more extensively, so I don't know if we're gonna have time to just step-by-step step through all of that. But the numbers that are in the calculator are from the RDRS, Recycling and Disposal Reporting System, and reported over directly the day the year opened, or the day before the year opened, so they're a current in RDRS as of June 14th. So any numbers that you would want to change as far as what was reported in disposal, you need to first get changed in RDRS. And so once they're changed over there, then you would submit a disposal modification form, noting that the data is changed in RDRS and you are gonna, and you've also changed the number in the year to match the RDRS data. Uh, the further question at what percentage discrepancy in these numbers, is it worth correcting? that is completely up to you it depends on how much time you want to spend you know getting one ton changed here or there if it's a significant amount uh probably worth changing but we definitely have folks that say my per capita rate is going to be the same with or without this 2000 tons so it's not worth the trouble and they'll leave it at that so that would be up to you as far as what is worth uh changing discrepancy wise we have another question from Cynthia Van Holt regarding the city of Rolling Hills Estates that has a low population waiver. I cannot figure out how to complete the first section. Okay, the report is asking me to fill in all questions regardless of what is in page 20 that I do not need to do. Uh, not sure what that page 20 reference is, but as Andrew already demonstrated, if you have a waiver, that box would already be checked and you should be able to fill in info that you need to, but you won't have the same required fields that you would if you did not have a waiver. And, oh, Andrew, you want to go ahead? I was just going to say, Chris, we're at time, and I think we have lots of outstanding questions here. So lots. I'm going to pass you back, presenter, Chris, if you don't mind putting up the um, slide that has our contact information. Mm -hmm. And then while he's getting that together, I'll just say it um, verbally. So for those that have already emailed the slcp.organics at cowrecycle.ca.gov email inbox, we will get to your questions. If you've only provided your question in the chat, 
I would like to request just for us tracking and make sure we don't miss you. If you could email your question to slcp.organics at calrecycle.ca.gov. We will um, be sure to address all your questions through email. Um, we will also make ourselves available if needed to do walkthroughs of any of the sections of the report on kind of individual basis as needed. And um, yeah, I don't know. Kara, Ashley, is there anything else you want to add before we sign off here? No, nothing to add. Um, we're just really happy to answer any of the questions that weren't answered today. Yeah, so sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, and then I also just want to note that we are taking all the feedback that we receive on these different questions and making notes. So for the next reporting cycle, we can hopefully smooth out some of these bumps and make things a lot clearer and more straightforward. So thank you so much for attending and we will talk to you soon.